just checking that it's recording. Um, just to make sure it doesn't kick us off. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think some people are still going to be joining, but I'll just admit them, let them in as they come. So, yeah. Perfect. Cool. Um, Megan, uh, yeah. is, is everybody else got a tiled layout or is it just me? Um, I've got a tiled layout, but it depends on your own screen. On your own screen. Okay. okay cool. cool. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and let's get this thing going. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so blessed to have Carolyn Apoth presenting today from Kenya. We were blessed to meet her at the Saturday conference in Joburg earlier this year. And I was totally blown away by her presentation and thought we must have to come speak for everyone to see. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time, Carolyn. And yeah, we'll let you just take it away. Um, thank you. Thank you, Astrid. Um, thank you for having me, guys. It's really a pleasure to, to be here to talk about my work, talk about our work. Um, yeah, and to be able to interact with your community. And I think the R community is really, 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 really supportive. I was telling my friend the other day, like, when I get challenges and I post it anywhere, like on Twitter or on the Slack channels, I get very many responses to my challenges. Like, I think that's really good for building a community around being able to help each other and like being able to upskill and grow each other all through. So, yeah, so do I start? Yeah, go for it. Uh, and just okay. say, thank you so much for coming to speak today. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, yeah. Now I can't see myself, but okay. <laughs> Um, so hi everyone. So my name is Caroline. Today I'm going to be talking a lot about us, the, um, the a project we did on spatial variation in the in the prevalence of sexual and gender based violence in Kenya. Um, so full disclosure, this was initially my a school project, but it has gone evolving over time, and now it's like something bigger. So this is about myself. I am um, um, a student of. Master's of Science student in Jomo Kenyatta University uh, doing GIS and remote sensing. And I also practice and support uh, women in GIS Kenya as a special data scientist and, and also as an advocacy lead for the community. Um, so I know you're wondering what women in GIS Kenya is. So women in GIS Kenya is a group, a group of women that came together to be able to create a platform where we are able to work around the problems that we initially faced um, like while starting out in the field or while trying to build up our careers. Uh, so it's ideally a consortium that's made up of people in academia, people in government, uh, people in private industry. So it's like, it's a whole array of people. Initially it was just women, but now we've grown to, um, to have a lot more than women. So we have people from students, people as young as students and also people as old as people who've been in the industry for more than 20, 30 years. Uh, we work to foster relationships and resource sharing among our members and institutions. Um, the foundation of our work is, is based on us being able to provide a platform for sharing of knowledge and experiences. So that's what we try to do. We try to look for ways in which we can foster uh, growing relationships between members of our community and also people who want to join our community, as well as uh, institutions, partners and stakeholders who are, who are working towards the same objectives that we are. And the objective of, of, of our group is to be able to have um, an equitable industry where people have the same amount of access to resources, the same amount of access to opportunities, to data, to literally everything that makes um, our lives easier. Um, so our activities for the organization range from having social gatherings. Okay, before COVID, we used to have social gatherings. And then we also have professional development trainings. Uh, we have educational events in universities and, and colleges. We also have opportunities, opportunities for networking, uh, mentoring, and also uh, we do some bit of research and project delivery, which is like part of what forms what I'm going to present today. Um, so as an introduction, um, yeah, so part of what we do is, is, is we try to do projects that are impactful um, and maybe to qualify this in as much as we say we are women in GIS Kenya and we are open to everyone, we try as much as possible to make our projects or things that we work on to just be around women issues and trying to solve 
uh, women issues in our society. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the project that we are, we did, are doing, uh, which is on gender-based violence as a part of uh, GBV or other. Yeah, it's a part of like the, 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 the bigger violence scope. Um, so just as an introduction, uh, what is GBV like? What would we all describe uh, GBV as? Um, oh wow, here I wanted to ask all of us what it is before I shared this slide, but well, I guess now it's too late for that. Um, so I wanted us to discuss what we all understand by the term GBV, uh, because from our research we found out that uh, different cultures, different countries and different regions have different understanding of GBV. Like for instance, um, there's an area in the world where um, something like marital rape is not considered, is not considered rape it's considered fulfilling your conjugal rights. Uh, there's also some areas where emotional abuse is not considered gender-based violence, just considered, well, usual harassment. So there's there's this aspect like those, but just as um, for definition, um, I love to, maybe not I like, uh, GBV it has been described as the harmful act that is perpetrated against someone um, or against a person's will that is in most, in most cases, or more often than not, uh, purely based on their gender, like on gender differences. Uh, so from research, we found out that um, aspects of GBV or, or aspects or, or situations in which GBV occurs uh, is mostly in situations where there's a, power, there's a power dynamic and either the man or the woman is trying to establish more power on the, on the other person or on their partners. Um, so GBV includes uh, there's a whole array of aspects of GBV, and it starts from rape to sexual exploitation, uh, forced prostitution, domestic violence, um, emotional abuse, um, early marriages are uh, being forced into traditional practices such as uh, FGM and and like so on. Like us being able to describe GBV is is much more than much more than rape. It's much more than uh, being physically assaulted. Like it's the whole array of uh, whatever harmful act is being per perpetrated on someone. Uh, so there's some effects of GBV that have been known uh, from studies and also from like um, generally looking at, at people within um, a community. And this include emotional distress, um, mental health problems, uh, having poor reproductive health, uh, the risk of uh, getting HIV and other STDs, and also having lower levels of education because um, you might be mentally affected and then you're not, you're, you're no longer able to access education, or the, the person who inflicted this on you was probably the person who was responsible for financially supporting your education. And now that that person is no longer there, you're not able to access that education that you, you, you actually uh, uh, yearned for. Uh, so now let's talk about how GBV is monitored globally, and then we are going to go localizing it into like Africa and then into Kenya. Um, sorry, this, this is going to be like based on Kenya because the study was done in Kenya. So GBV uh, globally is, is, is monitored uh, based on the number of reported cases. Uh, so what this means is that um, unless a case is reported, that entry is not going to go into the aspect of monitoring and evaluating GBV cases uh, globally. Uh, so what this means is that um, if, you, if you experience GBV probably in a household and then you don't, you don't report, like it's not, it doesn't go as a reported case either at the police station or either at um, health facility or in any institution that um, that works with victims and survivors of GBV. If it's not reported, it doesn't go as a statistic, which in my opinion, I think is a loophole in the management and education or especially for victims um, around GBV. Um, and this information I got from the reporting of SDG5, SDG5 purely focuses on gender equality. But uh, the indicator 5.2.1 just looks at uh, just looks at GBV, and now it 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 goes further on to focus on the proportion of ever partnered women and girls who are who are above the age of 15, which is like the um, the least age of married women and girls in the um, in the world who have ever experienced GBV. Um, so the same study. Excuse me. So the same study shows that uh, between 15 to 76 percent of women in that in this category have experienced a GBV. So they they like they've actually either experienced physical or sexual viol uh, violence in their lifetime. Um, 
there will be a case where someone has experienced that, but they're not aware that they have experienced that. Uh, oh, God. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's supposed to be like a slide to show us um, the proportion of women globally who, who don't who don't consider being physically assaulted or who don't consider being sexually assaulted as um as a crime or as an act of dbb so and and, and this was a study done by unsda uh, that showed this uh this statistics so it wrote, it, it put it put about uh 45 25 to 45 percent of women between the ages of 15 to 15 to 69 having have experienced um, any form of DBV, the ones that I mentioned initially, like rape, um, FGM, emotional abuse, um, all those things, they would have experienced that, but th they did not consider it any form of DBV. Um, so here, then, uh, I, I want to now focus this entirely in Kenya and to look at um, the number of cases reported in Kenya and how reporting is being done in Kenya. Again, the same way reporting is being done globally is the same way reporting is being done in Kenya. Like a case is not a case unless it is actually reported either at a police station or at a, or, or at a health facility. Now, in the case of Kenya, um, unfortunately, a lot of up-to-date data is done mostly at health facilities. So there's a system called the DHIS, D District Health Information System, which is a system that is mostly used by public health facilities in Kenya that picks this information. So if you go to a health facility and you report that you have you have been raped or you have been assaulted or someone has beaten you up, um, so they log that in as a case and um, and um, under DHIS too. Um, so this by the time of uh, by the time we were starting this project, that was towards the end of 2019, uh, this was the cases like these are the number of cases that were reported for the past 72 hours. Like please note the past 72 hours by like by the time we're collecting this data. And you can already see uh, the list is like two, two, two cases per county, but the highest is up, up to 1500 cases per county. So consider this as how many days is 72 hours and we already have 1500 cases being reported within those 72 hours. Like it's already, it's already problematic. And we are not considering people who actually experienced this and they didn't go, uh, they didn't go report. Yeah. Um, so here we're looking at so 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 why why is it important that we are focusing on on GBV? Why is it important that we are focusing on on this aspect? Um, so this came about because we want to want to be part of the community that actually helps the world achieve SDG five, and this SDG five is 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 on um, gender equality, but specifically on SDG five point two point one is to eliminate all forms of violence against women. So uh, look at it this way. If, if in Kenya specifically, we are experiencing about 1,500 cases um, every, every 72 hours, and these are 1,500 cases of, 1,500 reported cases. So we are not looking at the, the, the other unreported cases. So if we actually do a physical survey, like if we actually get a team and we get questionnaires and we get a good survey forms and we go into the field and we look at, how many people, uh, and ask women and girls between 15 and 69, have you ever experienced a GBV? Imagine the amount of numbers you are going to get out of that. Um, so in Kenya, there's a Kenya National Policy on Prevention and Response to GBV, um, whose goal, uh, the goal for SDG5 is to completely eliminate. So this is looking at like 0% of, 0% of, 0% uh, prevalence. So like in this case would be to have, zero numbers on this map so to have like if there's an extreme case of sdbv in, in in any county so like two would be would be the extreme case um so that is the goal for that's the global goal uh, for sdg5 but the local goal is to reduce to reduce the previous uh the previous cumulative the previous annual cumulative prevalence uh by between 35 to 45 percent now when we're doing this study we looked at why do we want to reduce this by 35 to 45 percent? Why not reduce it to? Why not target to reduce it to like um, zero? Um, and this went on to go into look into in, uh, to look into the education of women, the education of girls, and also the education of men. Um, it would be ideal if we, if we wanted to target like zero percent prevalence. But in as much as in, in as much as it is ideal, it is not. 
it will not be possible it, it will not be possible to achieve that as an annual target so i would understand how this document the kenya national policy would want to target at only 35 percent because this will mean um if this year we are looking at these numbers so this means by like like next year we hopefully reduce this to uh, by 35 percent and then the other year we reduce the new number by 35 percent so yeah that's where it's currently going um so for the um, to work on this project we used a uh, model based geostatistics uh, which is a part of spatial statistics that is concerned with doing like continuous uh, spatial variation of aspects um and this was very helpful in in in, in being able to actually look at create create high resolution maps of gbv cases in kenya so i think i'm going to reference this map a lot um so what this means is that um what what mbg model based geostat geostatistics will do for us is instead of reporting cases for the whole county we are able to reduce all these cases to like the specific area in the county so that we, so that if you if you want to do like targeted um targeted mitigation measures we know exactly where in the county we want to look at uh, so for instance if we've, we've identified that in nairobi we have 1500 cases but we don't exactly know what part of nairobi i mean Nairobi is big. Okay, in the context of this map, it doesn't look as big, but Nairobi is big. Like Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya. Uh, so you want to look at what specific part of Nairobi I want to target for like uh, girl child education. Uh, it would be best to specifically identify the specific location. And that was a very important thing that we were able to do with model based geostatistics. And then we we're also able to identify to determine the achievement of policy threshold. So that is SDG 5. M MDGs and, and the national policy. Um, and then also identify hotspots. Identification of hotspots um, means that we are able to work with, to identify like specific areas in a county. So if say, if it's, if it's a county like uh, Mandera or Garissa, we're able to identify like a specific area here that is a hotspot because it could be that uh, we are reporting all these numbers like all these five numbers for the whole county but ideally it's just an area probably around the border or probably around a town that has all these cases so that's what identification of hotspots mean um and then finally to be able to and un to unmask like hidden uh, hidden 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 issues patterns or trends uh so this meant to to like overlay to be able to overlay this gbv data with other data sets uh, like overlaying this with uh, data sets such as maternal education, paternal education, access to access to contraceptives by the woman, um, um, the, the the cultural practices of the area or the general upbringing of the of the of the partners, both the woman and the man in in relationships, or just of the partners without having to define. Uh, so this was the result. Like this was the first result of us of, of us being able to to do us to create point based point based maps. So in 2008, so this was the case. In 2014, this was the case for physical for sexual violence, and in, for in terms of physical violence, this was the case. So these numbers were, were were actually broken down from a survey. It's called a demographic health a demographic health survey. The Kenya Demographic Health Survey for 2008 and for, and for 2014. Now I know you'll be wondering why why would we be looking at data sets that are this old for like 2008 and for 2014, while we have information that's been picked by health facilities for 2019 and 2020. Um, so let me just qualify qualify this and say um, we had an op like we opted for this because it's a survey that was conducted. So this covers for every person like you see the way a census is conducted so this is the way this survey is conducted so it covers for every household in every household in the country or a sample of every household in the country was actually asked this question a very specific question um have you experienced gender-based violence and then there's an explanation of what gender-based violence means so this uh this is why we opted for this uh because it has it's it's, it's first it's more data uh, it's more conclusive data as opposed to using data from data that's been picked from a health facility because data that's been picked from a health facility uh, already removes or eliminates a lot of unreported cases yeah um i don't know should i ask if this this question uh, there's any questions so far
my guy? Yes, that's true. Cool. Okay. No questions from my side. Um, I just wanted to ask quickly, um, sometimes the acronym is SGBV and sometimes GBV. What does the S stand for? Okay, oh, sorry. Um, SGBV is sexual and gender-based violence, uh, and GBV is just gender-based mm -hmm. violence. So the difference between SGBV and GBV is that for SGBV, it's, it's, it's very specific, like it's just um it's it, it just taken the sexual aspect of the violence mm -hmm. that would occur to either gender but for gbv it's just gender-based violence so it's gbv encompasses a lot more mm -hmm. but sexual uh, sexual gender-based violence just encompasses the sexual aspect of the violence okay so so that will include rape and yeah probably the strip rape and all other forms of sexual assault. Let me not conclusively say rape. So it's rape and every other form of sexual assault. Okay, do, do I continue? Yeah, go for it, thanks. Okay. Um, so here I've spoken about uh, the, the surveys and why the surveys were, and why these were important as a assault. Is a different source. Um, remember, I've spoken about like looking at all the aspects that could be leading to could be leading to S, uh, to DBV, like in our case, and from 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 various studies that have been conducted and from having um, interviews with uh, with with probably survivors. Let me call them survivors. Uh, these were some of the top aspects that were that we found out. Um, so let me just say that this is not conclusive, like we are not saying that this is a conclusive list, but it's just a list of the top four, uh, the top five, the top four, the top four aspects that are, have been known to lead to DBV in Kenya. Uh, so this is alcohol and drug abuse, maternal and paternal education, a poverty index, and then cultural beliefs and upbringing. Uh, so we wanted to do a test on of this, of all these four variables, okay, let's make them five because we split maternal and paternal into two, uh, because the aspect of either the um, either 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 parties being educated tends to reduce or educated or not educated tends to, to reduce or increase the possibility. this into five and then we're able to conduct a test that that tells us of these five of these five covariates or, or or of these five variables which one is most important or which one is most likely to lead to more cases of dbv in kenya so this is what um this was the result of that and we also did a feature a feature importance test that showed us that paternal education is what's called uh, is what's called high uh, so this was the feature importance that we conducted and it was the variable on paternal education that's called high. Um, please note that like uh, poverty index and alcoholism, uh, they show as this because the index we are using was really low. I should have probably corrected for this because it shows that there's nothing but there's actually something. Um, so paternal education scored, uh, scored highest and the reasoning and like from from the analysis of this and from, uh, and from like um being able to draw a conclusion from this feature importance it shows that in most cases not all but in most cases uh where dbv um, happens in a household uh, there's probably the combined case of alcoholism uh, like a higher poverty index um cultural beliefs and upbringing uh, but it is the fact that probably the, the person inflicting DBV has not been like educated enough or like has not been told enough times that it is wrong or they've probably been told and they know it's uh, and they know it's wrong but in cases where they could not be educated but then they're exposed to alcoholism uh, the fact that the fact that they're not educated increases the chances of DBV yeah so this is what um, this means um, and this is the the result so the prevalence of like sexual based sexual based violence in Kenya is this with red being high and then the greens being low. So this is like cases where or areas where prevalence of 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 GBV is really high. 
and then on the right we have remember we also, uh, we also wanted to test for the threshold of achievement of uh, or rather to test for the achievement of policy thresholds that have been set out uh, so here in this case we worked with a 30 percent threshold and we were able to see that in most most parts most parts of kenya have not been able to reach that 30 percent reduction of the previous cumulative um, annual prevalence of of GBV in Kenya. So, yeah, this is where this is where this is at. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, 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 hopefully by the end of this, like, like uh, this, I again, I said this. We want this to be like an extensive study, and we are able to further break down. Like, this was a study that 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 did conclusive or, or rather did it was an inclusive study so we covered all aspects of dbv but we then separated it to sexual and physical violence but then again we want to do to go further into uh, things like emotional abuse uh, workplace harassment availability or uh, accessibility of resources for women and yeah for women at workplaces and people who are disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged at work at, at workplaces so, so like this is a like a starting point to the work that we want to do and the work that we are planning on doing so the purpose of this is for us to be able to conclusively and like use data to be able to drive for policy development we don't want to be a group that just says uh, women are disadvantaged or like this kind of people are disadvantaged but we actually want to show with results we are saying we are disadvantaged because you can conclusively see that this is where we are this is where kenya is and this is where like other parts of the world are yeah, and and then to also be able to guide, uh, to guide um the implementation of mitigation measures or like uh, the implementation of education for 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 different areas because um like different areas need like different kinds of education. So if like an area like um an urban area like Nairobi, the kind of education you give to girls and women in Nairobi is probably not the kind of education you give to women and girls in a remote area like in Garissa or in Wajia yeah okay so i wanted to also give a special thanks to the people who supported this project um and this was like dr dr Masi from joma kenyatta university and also peter masharia from the Cambry welcome trust I, I i had invited them to do to this talk now i can't see whether they made it or not but yeah so this this brings me to the end before i go on to talk about other work uh, the other work that women in gis does uh but i'd like us I'd like us guys to discuss this. What do you guys think so far? What conclusions are you drawing from this presentation? Yeah. Great. Yeah, there's already um, questions in the chat. <laughs> um, Maria uh, uh, asks, how do you operationalize um, cultural beliefs and upbringing? How do you operationalize cultural beliefs? Mariana, maybe you want to unmute and clarify? Yeah. Hi, yes. Um, so I was wondering like, if you take that variable from the survey, so what was the question that was asked that you used then uh, to control for cultural beliefs and an upbringing? Or where does it come from? Okay, um, so for this, for this there, was, uh, there was a survey that was done and it was, it was um, it was interview based so and then people would answer on whether or not they think uh like wife beating is is justified or not so it's just things like that and then when you when you probe further you go into into, into such questions as so why would you think wife beating is justified and then they tell you uh when i was growing up my my, my uncles and my dad um told us that like for you to establish um power like for you to establish authority in the house, then you have to show your power through that way. So these kinds of interviews were done for a, a, a collected sample of people within a region, and then that is what created the data set that we use for cultural beliefs and upbringing. Um, the others were picked, some others were picked from the demographic health survey uh, because they were already available. Thank you. Um, Cool. And then Anastasia asks, um, what was your sample size per study site? Um, DHS is clustered according to clusters in cl clusters in Kenya. So it divides Kenya according to clusters. And then from these clusters, we get 
400 households. So like 400 households per, per cluster. Awesome. Um, I have a question. Okay. Um, uh, so reporting is obviously a major limitation of any study on gender-based violence. So um, reporting yeah. to the person who comes to your house to survey you or reporting to the police. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on like um, maybe some sort of technological uh, intervention so that people, maybe if they experience some shame around telling another person, you know, I've been abused or I've been raped, um, you know, maybe if people might feel comfortable using like an app, for example, to um, say I was sexually assaulted by my husband, but I'm unable to go to the police or I can't go to the police or whatever. So a, a place for people to report gender-based violence, give um, researchers a better kind of understanding of the, the problem. Do you think that that's um, sort of a, a, a viable option for future studies into gender-based violence? Um, I think it is. Um, I honestly think it is. But but I think something like um, um, probably a USS decode would be would be easier for mm. people to report because like having having a whole application in a situation where you're already facing um you're already facing violence in your home and you're not in a position to like go somewhere quiet where you can input your data um either either having a very silent app or using a quick ussd code would i think would mm. work best for me uh, because also looking at at the um, at the survey report on the on the challenges that um that the interviewer interviewers were facing while trying to collect this data was also a case of um someone not being able to actually report on what happened to them because they feel like the moment I tell you, then everyone knows because there's still the issue of uh, stigmatization of um, you, you went to the police or you went to the health facility to report that you were you, 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 you assaulted. So there's, there's the whole thing of people having to live around with that. Um, and the challenges we were facing was, again, people not wanting to report. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think a USSD is a very good option for that, um, or or a link, yeah. you know, some way to just or a link, like, your experience like something very, very, very silent, where you mm. can quickly quickly do something. Uh, but also, uh, I, I, I'd love to highlight that there's um, the State Department for Gender has uh, has a call center and has a um, has a call line where people can be able to call and register and register their um, grievances uh, or, or just report the cases that they have and i think so far and from 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 when the lockdowns and cessation of movement started in kenya i think this has so far been working because um reports from them show that uh in as much as the number of cases are increasing uh people actually being able to report like, like that's also improving with mm -hmm. time like people are actually finally understanding that it's not your fault that this happened to you and you can get help when you report that it happened Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, any other questions before we move on to the next part of the talk? You can just unmute and, and ask if you have a question. Yeah. Cool, I think let's go ahead. I have some more questions for the end. <laughs> so <I'll start. laughs> okay. Okay, so I can continue with this. Um, can you guys still see my screen? Am I still sharing? Oh, yes, I am. Yes, you're good. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah, so I mentioned like who, who women in GIS is, and I also wanted to highlight like some of the work that we do. Um, Again, our work is just purely purely on women issues and trying to solve uh, women issues. Uh, so part and 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 part and most of the sources of our projects come from things like this the uh, data visualization challenges. Uh, so I said we do we do meetups, we do projects, we do research, uh, we do capacity building and all that. Um, so uh, data visual visualization is also 
like as a as a product of the of the trainings that we carry out so this is like a challenge for us to be able to call out members of our communities or just members of other communities who want to participate in something that will be impactful because at the end of the day we try to share these reports and compile them and then share with with, with stakeholder with, with stakeholders or, or people who are in actual positions to make decisions and to like change things so this is currently something that's happening uh, visualization challenge uh, on teenage pregnancy. Uh, it came about as um, from a, a, another research that I'm going to talk about on us trying to look at the impacts, uh, the gendered impacts of COVID. And this came up as a, as a potential impact of COVID. So we want to find out like is, uh, was there, were there increased teenage pregnancies between, uh, between March and now? March was like the first time COVID, the, the, the first case of COVID was reported in Kenya. So that's uh, that's what we're currently doing. Please, guys, feel free to join us. And then we also have R for R for special data science technical sessions happening every two weeks. Uh, the next one is on August third. Um, yeah, and we also usually share the share the materials that are made available. Um, so apart from that, we also tried to support um, the reporting and monitoring of COVID cases in Kenya. Uh, we worked with various institutions for us to be able to do this um so the screenshot at the top just shows the the reports that have been made every day like how many cases are being reported per county and then what's most interesting uh, was the prediction models uh this was all based on r the prediction models were all based on r and we looked at or rather the bigger team looked at um various factors that were that were that were contributing to either increase or reduction of cases so for instance if there is cessation of movement what that will mean uh, what that will mean to the number of cases if there is um if people are social distancing uh, social distancing what that would mean if people are not washing their hands people are not wearing masks yeah that was what we were trying to do here you can see more about this on, on this website covid19.health.go.ke and again, on top of that, we were able to identify counties that were more at risk. Uh, this was a simple, this was a simple um, analysis, uh, a risk factor analysis that we conducted to be able to identify uh, counties that are risk uh, that are at risk based on four factors. Uh, that is the age of people who are above above sixty, the population density, the household size, and also availability of of, of sanitation sanitation measures like uh, availability of water, availability of clean toilets, uh, all those things that are COVID related. And this was the result of what we came up with. Now, the good thing about this is that it is interactive and like the further you zoom into the map, the more information you go finding out. So like if you want to identify an area like um, Garissa or Mandera, like you can zoom in and see um, areas that are uh, uh, that are actually at risk more than the others, because again, we didn't want to clog everything together into uh this county is at risk and this county is not at risk well we know for sure a county can be at risk but like a smaller area within the county can be more at risk than uh than the greater county uh, so something else that we had was uh, a, a symptoms tracker this was a simple application where people are able to input their um, input their, their their symptoms like to just directly input their symptoms and this was able to to um this helps the, the ministry to be able to manage the number of people walking into the health facilities to get tested. Uh, because if if you feel like you have symptoms, like if, if you feel like you just have a cold, but you don't have every other symptom, it, um, it is able to give you your risk level. So are you high risk? Are you low risk? Um, are you medium risk? And then if you're high risk, it tells you, please go to this facility or call this number. Then if you don't call, the ministry is able to follow up on you. Like you feel this, uh, you filled this application but you did not show up at any facility so yeah they were able to follow up on you based on that um and then finally and where and which is like the source of the data visualization challenge that we are currently uh, that we are currently doing uh we we try to understand the impacts of covid across four dimensions and especially for women um in terms of health in terms of economic um economic like development um fgm and dbv so in terms of health, we wanted to look at um, did COVID affect women such that they are not able to go to hospital the same way they used to. And we realized that uh, there were there were some cases where some women um, unfortunately lost their babies because the cessation of movement. Uh, at that time, uh, there was cessation of movement between 
7 p.m., 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so if you live in an area where you, you, you're, uh, you, you're not able to access ambulance services and you need uh, emergency medical um, emergency medical services, then unfortunately you're not able to get to health facilities on time because uh, there's literally no public transport operating at that time in the night because no one is going anywhere um, and places are closed. Uh, we also try to look at the the economic impact of of, of of COVID to women. Again, all this is to women. I don't know if that's unfortunate, but yeah, all this is for for women. Uh, we also tried to look at the economic impact of, of COVID on this, and we realized that um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, low wage or low skilled people in Kenya are women. And it's a lot of these businesses that were highly influenced because now if it's a business like selling, um, selling gum or selling um just selling things outside of like outside of the usual uh, working hours it will be mostly women and now with the with the um, mitigations that have been put in place by the government being there they were not they were no longer able to be able to deliver on that um then we also looked at fgm and we noted that there was an increased uh, increased cases of fgm because now the children are are more at home they don't have uh, they don't have schools to run to uh, they don't have they, they 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 don't have like um people in different regions to run to because again there was closure of intercounty intercounty travel or intercounty transportation uh so we noted if the, the number of gm cases increased and then we looked at gbv and again the number of gbv cases increased uh further uh sorry this was supposed to be a link that will de- uh, will lead you to more of that research and you will be able to see more I'll I'll send this link later because then I can't read it out now. Yeah. Okay, so here I wanted to talk about um, looking at all the data from uh, as much as much data as you could find from 2016 to 2019 and to see w- whether actually these cases are increasing or reducing. But then we noted like from 2016 to 2019 the cases have actually been increasing. Um, there's a newer there's a newer dashboard that shows. Up to up to where we are in the year, the cases for 2020 are actually more than the cases in 2019. Um, but for this, we can clearly see that we can't we, we can we cannot con- conclusively attribute the increase in SDBV cases to COVID. But we need to further look into why are these uh, why are these cases in, uh, increasing over time? Uh, one one aspect would be that we are probably reporting more cases, but then again, we can also say that these cases are actually increasing over time. Um, and then this leads me to currently what uh, current what we are currently doing for the State Department for Gender. Um, sorry, what I didn't mention was that we we are working to support the State Department for Gender to be able to to, to digitize their reporting and management of GBV data. And this starts from us having um, a form that the health the health officers fill. So now the difference between our form and what the system does is that our form is is like automatic and this dashboard is like readily available for them so the moment you fill that form uh, this number uh, the number changes immediately as opposed to uh, using dhis whereby uh, you report a case but uh, um, aggregation or like uh, the health officers being able to come back and look at this data only happens once a month like at the end of the month so in most cases what happens at the health facility level is that they input all this in a book and then they transfer this at the end of the month so by the time this is happening, there's so much that has happened to either the man or the woman who has reported this case. Um, yeah, so th- that was the basis of us being able to come up to come up with this dashboard. And this dashboard just this, uh, apart from showing the number of cases per sorry, apart from showing them the number of cases per county, it also shows a cumulative report of these cases like over time. Uh, it also shows the aggregation of these cases by age and by gender. So now we want to break them down to are we having more cases of of of, of GBV for on children between zero to five, or is it for adults who are between thirty to forty-five? Just trying to look at that, and then are more cases affecting men, or are more affected, uh, cases affecting women? Uh, and this will just help us to be able to conclusively make um, make decisions like on what happens in this area and what does not happen in this area. And then we're able to categorize all this data by the type of abuse that is uh, that is included to the victim by the offender. Uh, because we also noted that the, some of the data that is collected is the type of uh, is the type of abuse that is done by, or rather, the, 
classification of the of the of the offender so and we noted that in a lot of these cases it's people who are known to the victim which is quite unfortunate because it's like the people who are supposed to protect you actually the people who are taking advantage of you and then want to look at so now that we have all this information about um this case so what has happened to this person that has been that has been affected so we have all these variables to show what happened that to the to the people who have been affected so um were they linked to caregivers were this reported to the police uh, like is it a case that's currently ongoing in the judicial system and then to look at the total number of cases and then finally uh, which is like this is very important to identify each case by case id uh, because we realized and from like the last pre presentation i did in Joburg was uh, to show that a lot of cases end up getting lost in the judicial system but what we're trying to solve here is uh, to identify each case by case id and then have a separate dashboard where we are able to actually follow up on this specific case so if you enter case number three and then you find out ah this case number three only got up to only got one hearing in case so what's happening to this case because getting one hearing is not justice if case number five got like five hearings but then nothing happened to them we want to be able to get the root of that so yeah that's that's where we currently are with our other projects okay i guess um do, do, do i finish or do we first discuss this Maybe oh, you can advise me. Yeah, uh, yeah, if we can finish up and then have um, just open question time, that would be great. Okay. Okay. So if you're wondering how you can join us, uh, you can join us on our website, www.wigis.co.ke. And you can, uh, or you can just share our work on social media. You can become a member. You can host an event. Uh, you can host an event with us or you can become a volunteer. We actually really love volunteers because we are, we are currently a team of like eight people. All of us are technically volunteers of the organization trying to do uh, this work sometimes it can get overwhelming so we will we will really really love your support on this yeah so this is the rest of the team that we work with um yeah Hello? I think we just lost you there. Oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry about that. Uh, but I I was just I just finished on the team. Did you hear how you can how you can join us or how you can contribute? Yes, we got that. Uh, we just lost you okay. on the team. Okay, then the team and then yeah. That's it. Cool. There was nothing more. Um, Let's all clap in <laughs> our isolated spots. <laughs> Yay. Um, thank you so much um, for presenting your work and, and, and for the amazing work that you're doing. I think um, for me, it's just really amazing to have a model of seeing like what can happen with this data. Like we all know that gender-based violence is a huge problem, also in South Africa. And a lot of time we feel very powerless about what to actually do about it. And I think only once you really look at it can you start to unravel the contributing factors and start to piece together an action plan. And I, I really um, think it's really amazing. Um, uh, do we have any questions for Caroline? If anybody wants to unmute, otherwise I'm gonna go ahead and ask my questions. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, I wanted to find out um, a few things. Um, firstly, like, what is the general um, tech climate for women and girls like in Kenya? So, like, how many would you say women and girls get into coding? You know, how how big of a thing is it over there for women? Um, now, compared to about uh, five or so years ago. Uh, the numbers are certainly improving um and, I, and and by that i mean like by the time by the time us guys were in school a lot of tech based or a lot of engineering courses were, were were had a lot of men or had a lot of 
yeah, had a lot of men. Like, like the, the the higher percentage of, of of men in a class would be would would certainly be higher than women. But I think now that there's a lot of initiatives going on, introducing girls to code at at, at a very young age, uh, introducing mentorship sessions in in high schools and in primary schools, that has really helped the the landscape. And I think now there's there's a huge huge improvement in the number of women or girls who are in STEM related fields. That's amazing because I think that um, you know for women, especially for issues that affect us, we have a perspective that is just you know obviously you you can't get that perspective if you're if you haven't lived um, as you know in the margins in that way. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you, how did um, Women in GIS Kenya come to exist? So how did you find each other and start up this amazing project? Okay, so how did Women in GIS start? It's, it's a, like, uh, we are four co-founders, and I think all four of us sort of have a similar story, apart from like a, a bit of changes here and there. Um, so we all, we, all, we all found ourselves working in one organization. Um, so I'm going to tell like my perspective of the story. And while I was working in that organization, I was in charge of, of, of managing a conference. It was called an education conference for the East Africa region. And my challenge then was being able to find women presenters. I know this sounds very cliche, but it's actually, it, was actually a problem. it was actually a big problem. Like you would, you would put out a call for presentations or a call for, for paper submission, and you get a lot of men and by the time mm. you're concluding, like, and it really occurred to me that by the time I'm, I'm I'm concluding an agenda, it is full of men, and like I have like one or two women. So after doing that for a couple of for a couple of years, I started to ask myself why are women not presenting? Like why are women not uh, not wanting to put out their papers for submission? Like why are we not being seen? Um, mm -hmm. Then it ended up being a case of um, I would release a paper submission and then specifically say um, female applicants are encouraged to submit or like if you have a challenge please reach out to me. Um, at that point we started getting we started getting reactions such that um, I have a paper but it's not ready. I have a paper but I don't think I'm confident enough to present it. I have a paper but I don't think I want to present it alone. We started getting feedback like that. And then I realized it was the same challenge that I was facing when I was in university or, or, or like when I was um, a bit younger in my, in my career, I would face that challenge of, I feel like I want to present my work, but it's not good enough. I, I, I feel like the other person presenting their work would be, I really cannot stand in the same stage as people who are presenting their work. Um, so we realized it was a case of not being able to believe in yourself enough, but again, not being able to get um, to see enough women on the stage for you to think that if she has done it, then I'm going to do it. Yeah. So first, wanted to tackle the challenge of us not being able to find enough women in the field for us to be able to to like copy. You know, you see the way you can say um, if if Mariana has done it, I think I can also I can also do it. Uh, I can also do it next time. Uh, so mm -hmm. for that, we said, how about we have a uh, an event where uh, we just have women panelists, uh, women everything, just women talking about their experiences in the field. So we did that. And the first event had a great, great, great response. Like the response for that event was amazing. We, 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 we got so many people who wanted to attend. We got so many people who wanted to, uh, to present, to talk about their work. So many people who wanted mentors. Um, and at that time, it was just the idea of let's just have events. Like we are, we are not even going into creating community or in like, let's just have an event. And mm -hmm. from that event, we, we got we got all that we got we got all that like we got questions that led us back to say, hmm, how about we do this as frequently as we can? How about we do this monthly? Then now on doing it monthly, we, we also found out that we actually don't know enough women in the space to be able to do this. So we started, <laughs> started sending messages. Hi, do you know a woman in the GIS industry who'd be interested in? talking to other women about this. And instead of getting responses, and that is how the Women in JS community came up. And that, yeah, that was it. Um, That's amazing. The sisterhood, you know, yeah. encouraging each other. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. That's wonderful. Um, cool. I also wanted to ask you, um, how do you collate and source data for your challenges? Do you get that data from the, the government? Is it mostly like your own data collection? 
how are you actually sourcing your data for those challenges? For the challenges. Um, for the challenges, okay, let me let me start by saying like the genesis of a lot of our challenges and mm. like the genesis of a lot of the things that we do is is circumstantial. Is that the word? Yeah. In most cases, it's circumstantial. Is that we find ourselves at uh, we have uh, we have done a training and then we want to see from all these people we train how many actually got to, how many actually got something and then we talk to a stakeholder. Um, we try to work with as many stakeholders as possible, and maybe not work. We just we try to share what we are doing with as many stakeholders as as we want. Um, so and it's from this sharing, like for instance, if you work on um the challenge on cervical cancer and we share this to uh, 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 uh private firms uh government institutions ngos who are who are working with cervical cancer uh, they ask us questions hey so can you do a, um can you do an analysis on this so can you do an analysis on this and they end up sending us this uh this data because then we are not a source of data we we we, we are we are not an institution that collects data we mm -hmm. rely heavily who are already doing this work to give us this data so we try as much as possible to work with authoritative data for our challenges because we also want our our challenges to solve real world problems you don't we, we, we just don't want them to be we are learning about how to do analysis on r we want it to be we are doing this and it, and it will solve problem x so we try as much as possible for this data to be authoritative a clean it's not just data that we have picked up from somewhere and we are sending to people to run with it so yes <laughs> yeah, we try to work with people who actually generate <clears throat> the data wonderful um okay my yeah. last question is um the prediction models uh for the dashboard um so i think in the comments uh, i think it was may was it may said that um uh the you know it's dummy data the one that you showed obviously because it's very sensitive data but the um yeah. the the modeling uh, code is that available online um for how you predict um the incidence of GBV or is it still kind of sort of very internal for that dashboard? Um for the work for the work that we are doing with the state Dep department for gender, uh we mm -hmm. are still not at a place where we can be able to share to share mm -hmm. everything because it's still under prototype we are still trying to do like trainings with the uh, with the officers and with everyone that's uh that's involved but again we be, when we're working with them we try to work on the principle that it's going to help our community so like at the end of it all we should be able to share all that okay wonderful yeah. I think my colleague is she still here is she still here say hi yeah, my my colleague. yeah maybe she'll say hi <laughs> Oh my god, my network is pathetic, but guys, I'm still here. I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll, I'll talk on the chat box, <laughs> but nice to meet you guys. So, so nice to have all of you. I just, yeah, I, I'm, I find it so inspiring, um, women coming together to solve our problems, you know, and to look at our problems and also to, yeah. you know, highlight. Uh, it's really, really wonderful. And to empower other women. Um, cool. So, if anybody has any other questions, We'll let Carolyn go. You can go ahead and unmute if anyone has a question or a comment or, yeah, a little point of discussion. Oh, hi, Amadou. <laughs> cool. Okay. Then Maybe we'll if my network will allow uh, before you close off, I hope you guys can okay. hear me. Maybe just yes. to point out on the, on the dummy data, I was talking about the dashboard. And the mm -hmm. fact that uh, gender-based violence is very sensitive information. So any yeah. data we share publicly will definitely be anonymized data. So it can't be about the name of the victim or the name of the offender. We can only share anonymized data in terms of statistics and type of violence and probably uh, even maybe even age might be quite sensitive. But those are the dynamics that come in when you're handling gender-based uh, violence data or sensitive data. There's a lot of uh, checks and balances that come in in terms of security and what needs to be exposed to the public and what needs to be kept private. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Absolutely. Cool. Okay, then I think we should go ahead and wrap up right on schedule. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Oh, Zandile asks, how can um, how can they contact you? 
Um, can I share my email? Sure, and, and your Twitter handle. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, <laughs> I love how Carol's um, Twitter handle is Maps. Well, your your name on Twitter, Maps. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's email address and Twitter. I'm very fun on Twitter, I think. I love you. You on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, Yes, uh, Mariana says, is the date of his challenge until 29th July? I think it was extended to the 7th of August, is that correct? Yes, yes, yeah, we actually extended the deadline for that to the 7th of August because we realized um, people got to know about it a bit too late. So yeah, we extended for about a week. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, you guys can follow us on Twitter at Our Ladies Cape Town for anything else. And yes, thank you again so much for sharing uh, all your knowledge and wisdom uh, and the work that you've done. And we'll be in touch on the internet. Thank you very much for having me, guys. It's, I feel really nice to talk about this. I love to talk about this work. I feel really nice. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's important. And um, it's really, it's great that we could, um, you know, I think both of us were sponsored by the R Consortium to attend this conference where we met. Yeah. That yeah. Is, really amazing that um you know the art community really fosters this kind of um, interaction and i think it's really really cool to yeah actually take the initiative and spend time together mm -hmm. thank you so much okay i think that's it for for today bye everybody have a thank great you. evening have a good evening bye everyone bye, bye everyone bye. Thank you. Bye. cheers bye <laughs>